Each of our panelists could be successful in many professions, but they have decided to cast their lot in the dairy industry as actual dairy producers. Today, we'll hear why they chose to make a career of dairy and perspectives on the future of the dairy industry. We'll learn how they got started, what makes their dairies unique, and their management philosophies. Ashley Abbott, Fort Edward, New York, received her associate's degree in agriculture business from SUNY Global School and bachelor's degree in animal science from Cornell University. I think what we'll do here, folks, um, the, this front table will excuse themselves, and then when I read your introduction, you can come to the, come, come to the front uh, of the room, please, Ashley. In addition to her work at Alloway Farm, east of New York, a 1,800 cow herd, Ashley and her husband Robert own Joyride Farm in White Creek, New York, where they have 65 head. She and Robert have a son, Derek. So Ashley's going to be right over here now. <coughs> All right. Dan Boland, Clarksville, Iowa, graduated from Iowa State University with a degree in dairy science. After graduation, he worked as a herdsman for a small farm for the processing center, and he let, later began to work as a carpenter for a short time. Dan then moved to Turkey for two years before returning to his home farm. He and his wife, Lynn, and two children now work alongside Dan's parents milking 65 cows. Dan is working to build with two robotic Jeff Brantmeyer, Sherwood, Wisconsin, received his bachelor's degree in dairy science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Jeff is now part owner of, of Hill Rolls Dairy, LLC, Sherwood, Wisconsin, where they are currently milking 90 cows with a rolling herd average of over 31,000 pounds of milk. The farm has been named premier breeder and exhibitor of the District 10 Holstein Show and honored as the Holstein Association USA Herd of Excellence five times. He and his wife, Bonnie, have two sons. Diesel Hitt, Adam Center in New York, attended SUNY Global Skill, then transferred to Cornell University. After graduation, he worked for Scipio Springs Dairy in Union Springs, New York, then went on to purchase Winsong Dairy, LLC, with the partners of Scipio Springs, Bill Morgan and John Gilbert. Daniel <coughs> Diesel is currently the operating manager of their 600 cow dairy. He and his wife Katie have a son. Rounding out the panel is Brent Schuler, Fleetwood, Pennsylvania, who earned a degree in animal science from Pennsylvania State University along with a minor in agriculture business management. After graduation, he worked for a short time as a professional fitter. He is now a full time partner on. Schuler Farms LLC, milking 100 cattle. Under their S. Pine Lawn prefix, Brent has bred numerous All American and, and Junior Pennsylvania All American nominated cattle. Well, I welcome each of you to, uh, to the panel. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go alphabetically. We're going to have each of you give a brief presentation of your dairy, and then I'll come up and, and ask the questions of the panel. And for the, for the audience here. So Ashley, why don't, why, don't you, uh, why don't you come up to the podium first and we'll go from there. Hi, um, as John said, my name is Ashley Abbott and I farm with my husband Robert and our son Derek, who is almost a year old, in Fort Edward, New York. Our farm is called Joyride Holsteins and uh, we started three years ago in June of 2011. Uh, we milk about 50 registered Holsteins and a few registered ground Swiss. We operate out of a rented facility, it's a 50 cow tie cell barn. Um, we also have a coverall bedded pack barn for calves and heifers, um, and 60 acres of pasture, which we rotationally graze in the summertime. Uh, we purchase all of our feed. We feed alfalfa baleage, corn and a protein mix. Um, our main focus on our farm is breeding for high type and managing for production. We try to keep our costs low so we don't push our cows too hard for production. Um, we really like 
showing and hope to merchandise Mercado in the future. Um, and so my husband is the one who's on the farm full time. He makes the day to day management decisions. Um, any larger decisions are discussed between the two of us. And I actually work off the farm. Um, I actually just finished a job at Allen Wake Farm. I was a herd manager for three and a half years. It's an 1,800 cow commercial farm. And on Monday, I'll be starting a new job at Welcome Stock Farm um, as a herdsman. So I'm going to get to work with a kind of different kind of cow. So I'm pretty excited about that. And I think there's a lot of cool things to come in the future. So thank you.
knew I wanted to be an owner or a manager of dairy. And John and Bill and I sat down in the spring of 2008. And they were very helpful in helping me try to get started. I purchased 15 springers um, from the farm and with the goal of using those as equity to buy into a farm uh, sometime in the future. When I graduated from college, I really had nothing to do.
Um, we formed it as a way to bring me from the role of, as an employee into a uh, managing partner, and eventually I will purchase the, the shares out for the other partners in the LLC um, over time. We built 100 registered Bolstein, Register Bolsteins. Uh, they're housed in a tie stall barn. production and longevity. Um, we like to have cows that stick around and we've run six cows that have produced over 300,000 pounds lifetime production and, and uh, a lot uh, for us to keep cows around longer we sell about 30 to 40 head every year of so, uh, various neighbors do consignment sales or privately um, that kind of uh, helps diversify our income a little bit uh, uh, in addition to the cows, we farm uh, 700 acres of all of which is owned. Um, we try to grow as little forage as possible so we can kind of focus more of our land on uh, corn and soybean production and all that is sold as cash contract futures. And uh, we really come off a good years of high crop prices and that has helped us to off offset the, the lower milk prices. Um, I think our farm is unique because we uh, are able to support four families on a relatively small farm and um, make a good living doing it. We do not, do not hire any outside labor besides custom and ore hauling. We do all of our work ourselves um, and uh, kind of makes it a challenge at times, but uh, I think it brings everyone closer together and we all kind of focus on the, the main goal of being a, a profitable dairy. Um, what got me started in the dairy industry, it's something I wanted to do. I knew that's what I wanted to do my whole life. Uh, since I was probably like two years old, I don't know. It's been in my blood. I'm the sixth generation on the farm, and uh, it's just been my urge my whole life. Um, uh, like John said, I graduated from Penn State in 2008, and that was a great opportunity to go to college and, and uh, learn more about what I was going to do in my career, but more importantly, to get out there and, and make friends that were experiencing the same things that I was, and uh, create networks both at my university and through other people at other universities through judging and dairy challenge, um, and it's kind of like your uh, support network that you can call on people when, when you have a problem or a question and talk to them and get some answers and, and uh, help you out in the long run. Thank you. Well, some of you uh, have, have really kind of touched on this, but I, I, uh, the first question that I have is, is, uh, of you is, you know, each one of you could be highly successful in, in any uh, wide array of dairy careers, uh, or, or careers of any, not necessarily the dairy industry or, or, or any, any chosen profession. If you had to say one or two reasons what made you decide to cast your lot as a, as a dairy as a dairy farmer, what, what would they be? Why, why did you decide to do what you're doing each and every day? And I'm going to start off, we're going to mix it up a little bit. Jeff, how about you? And you've got the mic should be on. And I'll stay here and moderate and you can go from there. Well, thanks, John. I guess for me, it was just being able to work with the cows on a, a daily basis. Um, you know, just being around my dad and my brother, who I'm very close with, working with the cows. You know, whether it's getting up and pulling out that heifer calf in the middle of the night, maybe you thought she was going to be the next great one, or um, breeding that next next show cow, or whatever it was. You know, just just being with the cows on a daily basis, uh, we really enjoy it. Uh, we, I guess, we all focus on you know our own corrective matings and. Um, to me, that was the biggest thing. Um, after I graduated, I know I almost got convinced by John and the rest of the staff at Holstein to work for them, but I just knew kind of that going back home was probably the right place for me. And at that at that time, I think it was the right decision. So for me, it was just working with the cows, you know, the registered end of it, and you know, just being there and you know, doing the, the daily chores. And something for me, I grew up with, and actually. Some days you'll, you'll have some ups and downs, and some days not so good, but for me, that's that's why I'm that, I guess. 
it, uh, to Jeff's comment, I, I've had a little history with, with some of the people in this panel, and uh, you know, I, I wasn't successful with two of the people here. Tried to hire Jeff and Brent full time on, on more than one occasion to be classifiers. We didn't get that done, but at least well, I was able to get them to come here and share some of their thoughts with you. <laughs> so I'm glad, glad, uh, glad to have them there. And, and then Ashley uh, uh, and, and Brent are both uh, graduates of uh, Young Dairy Leaders Institute as, as well, who I get on it. So anyway, it's a great group here. Dan, why don't you address that same question? Uh, why Dairy Farm? Yeah, so I think a couple reasons. One Jeff kind of touched on is the family aspect. I really enjoy being back on the farm now and as my children. It's one of a few unique professions where your children can actually kind of tag along and be right there while you're doing your work. And they can be right there in the pit of the parlor and might need to be take a few extra seconds to say, no, don't pull that, don't touch that. Just right there, here, take this towel and take it over there. But it really is a joy to be able to work with your children. And the other, I would say, is is my passion to, to actually do it. For a couple of years, John mentioned in my bio, I was in Turkey exploring some dairy development opportunities. But every time I would sit around and talk with these guys about, here's some best practices. Here's things about management. Here's new technologies that are there. And the more that I would talk about dairy, and the more something inside me said, I really want to actually do it rather than just talk about how to do it. And so those would be the big reasons why now I'm at the farm and I'm doing it and I love it. Ashley, how about you? Same question. Um, so I actually did grow up on a farm. Um, but my parents sold out when I was in like sixth or seventh grade. Um, so I never really got a chance to take over a family farm. Um, but I had that love of registered cows kind of instilled in me from a really early age. I think I showed my first cow when I was like three or something, crazy like that. Um, and I just fell in love with it. And I knew that I wanted to be in the dairy industry. Um, and I actually, I, I tried a few other things for a while um, and found that I really suck at sales for one thing. And um, I just really missed cows. Anything else I tried to do, I was like, I really just want to work out farm. Um, and my husband was not raised on a dairy farm. He was kind of the same story as Diesel, actually. He started working for a neighbor farm when he was young and went to college for dairy and just decided he really liked it. And so the two of us together were like, well, why don't, why don't we just try and do it? And so I guess we're probably crazy, but um, it's, it's been a really awesome experience. And even though it's extremely difficult, I would not trade any of it for anything. Please don't say question. Uh, I just a couple I just I guess I enjoy the work out of it. And the other thing is there's a lot of instant gratification in in the business. It's that's one of the other thing I also mentioned you pull that calf and it's a dope dog cat and you get a nice hover cat that makes you feel pretty good or you can treat a sick cow and get her to come around that's pretty nice too or breathe and that's a really nice cow.
you face when started out when you started out there? So what were some of the big challenges that you that were faced initially faced you and faced you now? Yeah, so probably uh, a couple of things. Probably the first one was extremely conservative banking industry. Um, we don't have a lot of money, nobody really wants to loan you money. Um, so really that was probably a big one. Um, but you know, based on getting partnership or some people that had some experience and my partner did probably I would consider to be two of the best they let me kind of um, make some mistakes and, and uh, cost myself and have some money. Uh, but you know, it's the best way to, to learn. And the other thing probably was just from my experience of not growing up on a farm was not having uh, some of
one part of this, and it made us even want to try harder to do a better job, I guess, with the house and on a day-to-day -day basis. So, each one of our panelists have uh, had a lot of success at a very young age uh, in, in in their in their lifetime. And so, what would be some of the keys to your success uh, so far, Dan? Starting. Someone else to tell to somebody 
and um, that, that gives you a little bit more drive to achieve it. But what are your goals in, say, 10 or 20 years? Who wants to take that one first? You're only all getting a shot at it. Who wants to be the first one? Go ahead, man. Sure. I'm, I'm kind of in that process of I am visioning and saying I'm building green site, completely clean slate. So I'm looking, okay, this is year one, what's happening, but I want things set up so when year 20 comes, I'm not saying, oh, why did I put this barn here or this building here or in this, this way? And so I would say 10 to 20 years, I'm looking at kind of maxing out my little space at even 250, 300 cows, but being mainly family run labor still utilizing technology to keep those efficiencies and then also having a stream of international interns coming through and our family would really like to be part of developing and launching that next generation of global leaders that come through our barns, spend time with us and our cows and our family, and then go back to their countries and are the leaders of the dairy industry in their respective countries. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I guess I didn't, uh, it's an interesting question, Jim, because I haven't really thought about uh, goals for about 20 years from now, but I guess for me, it would be you know, just maintaining our herd the way it is, or actually trying to improve it. Um, I guess, you know, in 20 years from now, I don't, I would see myself still milking cows. But the problem is, where our dairy is located, it's extremely hard to add more cows because we're so landlocked. Um, and the thought of starting from scratch and building from scratch, we've kind of tossed around the idea, but it isn't really something that we're planning on doing now, 20 years from now. Maybe we might do that, but uh, I guess I feel we have a pretty good niche market um, with the cash crop sales, exporting embryos, uh, selling 60 to 70 fresh animals a year, um, that we're pretty comfortable, I guess, where we're at. But for me, the biggest thing would be maintaining the herd or even trying to improve it um, in 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, it's actually funny you ask that because my wife and I have uh, talked about this recently and so my partner is, uh, we kind of want to have a plan in place for, uh, for ultimately, I, I'm, I'm hoping my partner's going to retire someday. So we're, we're trying to think about that. It seems so far away, but my, old, my oldest partner is, is 20 years older than I am, so he's probably going to be retiring before I am. Um, uh, so we're, we're trying to think about that. I, you know, I think our, our main goal is to raise it judged by. Um, but as far as the dairy goes, um, you know, we're trying to look to maybe expand a little bit, but at the same time, we're looking hopefully to be able to allow my partner to smooth transition out into whatever they decide to do after dairying, whether their kids are coming in, and, um, or whatever it may be. Uh, I would say my goal in, in for 20 years from now is just to continue a successful farm and, and create a, or uh, maintain a situation uh, for the next generation that I was able, that I uh, had the advantage of having and, and train them and, and prepare the farm for, you know, future generations and at the same time dealing with an aging workforce. Uh, my dad and uncles are all, you know, over 50 and they're going to want to retire and, you know, we're going to have to learn to deal with employees or, you know, whether it's building a new facility that's more labor efficient uh, and just transitioning into that and on top of just breeding a better cow and, and merchandising more and uh, uh, just uh, keeping a successful farm. Yes. Um, so obviously one of our goals is to buy the farm that we're at now um, because we currently rent and that's not really a, something we want to do long term. Um, that'll give us a little more stability um, be a little less dependent on other people for our own success. Um, we also would like to start merchandising some more cattle. Uh, we've only been in this for three years, but the last two years we've actually had extra calves to sell every year. Um, and we've been selling off our bottom end. So we have it to a point now where all of our young stock has very good or excellent dams. And that's something that we want to keep up with and keep improving at so that in a few more years, when we're selling these calves, we're actually selling calves that have a little more value. Um, we put a lot of money into our animals, so we really need to get it out of the other end. Um, and that's, you know, 20 years from now, that's still where I see us. We don't, we don't want to expand, but we want to um, 
develop a salad herd that you can sell extra animals every year for, for some extra profit. Jim asked a good question about the future. Um, let's talk about the present. As, uh, as we're here in Dubuque, Iowa, in June of 2014, what would you say are three of the biggest challenges facing you at your dairies at this point in time? I'm going to start with you, Brent. Um, I'd say the three biggest challenges I'm, challenges I'm facing right now is, uh, you know, just the transition still, you know, into a managing partner, um, remaining efficient being a small farm, you know, we don't have the efficiencies as larger farms do in herd size for number of crop acres we farm, but try to remain as efficient as, he po as possible and, um, and also kind of uh, maintaining like the work-life balance and, you know, we can't work 24 hours a day, seven days a week and uh, that's something that, you know, it's not having any outside labor is it's kind of hard to balance, but I'd say those would be the three of the biggest things. Probably our biggest three challenges uh, most recent quarter is uh, for us as a labor. Uh, securing a, a good labor force and a reliable labor force can sometimes be a challenge with the time of the down the area. Um, we have a good crew right now, but you just never know what's going to come around the next quarter. Uh, probably the second thing is uh, in New York, we're blessed with uh, some strict uh, environmental rules, so that's always fun. Just one, I guess, a little different. Uh, I agree, agree with these uh, the other two. And labor is a huge issue. Uh, we all know that. Especially, at, I think, as you tend to milk more cows, it becomes an even bigger issue. But even for a herd our size, um, the three of us do the majority of the milking. And my dad isn't getting any younger. Uh, my brother's got a, a, a girl, not a daughter now. She'd be about two years old. I have two young boys. So there's a need to get away, refresh yourself. Um, but hiring people and dependable, good hard workers are very hard to come by, as we all know. Uh, the second thing I would say from a cow standpoint is probably rich production. I agree with what Bob said this morning in his talk that it's getting increasingly more difficult, I think, to get cows bred. Um, so that, that to us is a big challenge. Um, you really have to work at it. And the third thing that is really frustrating from our standpoint is the weather. We see like... We, we don't catch any breaks lately, um, but from year to year, it seems like the weather pattern is changing significantly. And um, I guess it's really frustrating when you're, you're trying to grow good crops and put up good feed, and you have uh, kind of unstable weather patterns. So those, I think, to me, would be the three biggest things on our, our dairy that we kind of look at and talk about. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say our top three challenges in the current structure is, is it's all related to transition and, and balancing that focus of giving the attention to the plans of the future without missing out on getting cows pregnant on time and taking care of things that need to be patched up or fixed up just to last another six months in the current system, whether it's in the feeding system, and, and it's that challenge of keeping the current cows and the current herd rolling along while not letting that interfere with the plans of the future. And then I would say the, the volatility and uncertainty is a challenge, and, and it's not just where the milk price is going to go, but it's what are government programs and rules and regulations going to be. <laughs> Maybe there are tough environmental rules for certain areas, and are those going to show up in other areas? And, and when our new farm bill programs going to be enacted, what does sign up look like? 
what are all the, the pieces there, and it's hard to be in a place where maybe there are some programs you could use, but you don't know what the rules are, and you're just going to move on and say, I'm not interested in the government. So those are some of the challenges.
be more special classifications, skill categories and that, but uh, I think the Holstein Association needs to uh, just uh, make sure that, that their services are, are making money for people and, and, you know, whether it's small farms or the big farms, that the cost and the time you put in the, you know, whether it's tagging a cat or doing registration, you have to make, the bottom line is that it has to make money for people and it doesn't, it has no future. I'd be interested to hear your comments if you were watching this morning when Holstein presented their enlightened uh, program. Uh, it seemed to me that you're the age group that could jump on this and its infancy and really make a headway with it. I'd be interested to know if any of you have given us some thought in the last couple hours that we've known about it, whether you will incorporate it in your operations. I guess I didn't see it, and I, I mentioned Mark Kern just told me about it about an hour ago, and it, it has my interest because if I could have a, a more searchable, usable tool to handle that data and not just, well, here I got my email from Holstein, and here's my PDFs, and it's kind of awkward to scroll through, and okay, here's this heifer, and here's her numbers, and just store it all up in here, and as the size expands, and it's not store 20 up here, it's store 200, it can get tricky to then be back out with the calves and remember, oh yeah, there you are, you were 200 over parent average, yeah, I can kind of see that. And so I see any time, that's the future, Bob. That's, the future is, whether it's dairy or anywhere, it's data and managing data and having good data that allows us to make those right management decisions. And as margins are tighter, decisions need to have that data to back them up and say, yeah, right here, exactly here is the line to meet those margins and that profitability to thrive. Yeah, I would kind of agree. Uh, I think it is, you know, kind of the next wave, the technology, you know, kind of like social media, everything is online. Um, you know, you could have it right there in front of you, you know, it'd be a quick reference. I guess from my standpoint, I think we would use it, but I would use it more of a tool as to, okay, here the data, the data is, I can pull it up, it's right here if we have any questions. I don't know if I'd use it so much as a sorting tool, just because our sample size isn't that many animals. And I'm not going to say, okay, let's put her on the, the graph, and she's the most one, so I'm going to call her. Well, we don't necessarily, we more probably use it for recipient before we call her, just because we don't have, you know, three, four hundred helpers where we can use it that way. But, I think it's definitely a great tool and it's something that is going to stay here because people like fast, accurate data and they can get it now. Right. Other questions? Yes? Um, first of all, I want to compliment each and every one of you. I think it's awesome to see the enthusiasm and the excitement amongst young people up there. Um, another comment I want to make is um, Definitely take time to spend with your young families you're raising. You will become burnt out in the business way too early if you don't. Take time away. Um, I grew up in a family where we didn't take enough time away. People thought that, or my parents thought that if you go away, things happen. Um, they're going to happen no matter what. And so take time to enjoy your families. Take time to get out and uh, and see what's happening. But the question I have is, I grew up on the East Coast. I, um, my whole family lives back there in dairies, and I moved out west. And one of the things we're facing, you guys, some of you reiterated on it, is the environmental stuff. Um, we're hit extremely hard with that. The other area we're hit extremely hard with is, um, and you guys really can relate to this because you just, you know, shortly out of college, is the fact of these young people that are so far removed from agriculture now. And how do you relate to them to let them know? Because we see these animal rights people and all this stuff being at the forefront with such a small amount of people doing what you're doing. Your voice is so important to what we're doing. It's 
So I guess uh, I completely know where you're coming from on that. Um, so one of the things we've done on our farm is we've just tried to get a few younger high school kids every year if we can to have absolutely nothing to do with farming. Just get them on the farm and show them that, hey, it's not that bad. And it's a good, a good situation. We try to do a few farm tours. Europe does a really, really good job of promoting dairy in a positive light. And they're not afraid. Uh, there's a few organizations that are not afraid to take on um, some of the activist groups. And they've done really well with that. Um, and I think that's probably going to be the trend. We're just going to have to spread that across the country. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's show our voice a little bit more. I don't know if the industry would do a, a good enough job with that right now. But, you know, we, we do a, a good job farming. Right. Um, yeah, that was a really good question. I, it's going to be more important as uh, this trend is people are so concerned about where their food is, it comes from and how it was produced and how it was raised. And I think I have attended YDLI and I learned so much in that program about how to deal with these people, like the animal rights people. And, and I still have a tough time understanding their, their logic and what they're saying. And it makes no sense to me, but there's... Those people, you're probably not going to change their mind, but there's a lot of people that are kind of on the fence, and I think now's the time to go out and, and show those people what we do, whether it's through a farm tour or taking a calf to a school or, uh, you know, hosting an open house. Last fall, as part of my Wadi Eli project, we had a farm tour uh, on our farm, and we had about, it was over 300 people came out. None of them had anything to do with agriculture, and, and it was a lot of work getting ready for it, and... You know, it wasn't anything that was going to make me money at the end of the day, but it was really rewarding to have take people through the barn and show them the calves and, and you know, as they were leaving, say, you know, wow, you know, I, I just, you know, I'm really impressed with how you do things and how healthy and comfortable the animals were. And, and you know, they just, you know, look at things so much better. And just give people exposure because they don't, they're so far removed from agriculture. They, they just believe what they saw online or read in somebody's blog that if that person who wrote it has don't have a clue, you know, just give people exposure and leave a lasting positive image in their mind about agriculture and you know dairy or agriculture in general. Yeah, I kind of agree with Brent said too, you know, the biggest thing is you have to be proactive about it and you have to promote uh, agriculture, your business and you know the proper treatment of animals. You know, whether it's you know, the so-called uh, breakfast on the farm uh, or Sunday on the farm, you know, the county fair or whatever. You have to get people there, first of all, and show them that, you know, there's more to this than, you know, what, what you see. There was a theory near us uh, last year that kind of had a big issue with this. And um, But, you know, the biggest thing was, you know, they put the clamps down on them. They probably should have, but, you know, it's you got to be proactive and tell these people that, um, you know, go to a farm once, you know, come to our place or go to, you know, somewhere where they do a nice job, just walk through the barn and you'll be pretty amazed at things that they will do, go out of their way to try to save that cow or save that calf or um, look at the positives and, you know, all those people try to do is throw out the negatives. But to me, the biggest thing is just to promote, promote what you do and be proactive against those groups because I don't think you're going to get them. Those, those groups have a lot of money and I think they're here to stay. So, um, that would be my response to that. Yeah, and, and in our new barn, we intentionally, my wife and I, in our planning, have said, how can we set our barn up to better serve people coming in and, and say, we're going to develop a connection for these guests that come to our farm. And yeah, we're going to call people guests. We're going to really roll out the hospitality when people come and give them a connection to where their milk is coming from. and. Hopefully, we're going to then influence influencers that are going to go out and they're going to then be in their mom's group or whatever, and they're going to vouch for when they're hearing some sort of bad story, they're going to vouch and say, no, I, I've been to Dan and Lynn's farm, and, and here's how it is, and here's the things that they do to give their cows the very best care. And so those are the ways to be proactive and to be intentional about connecting with our consumers to get beyond, we make our milk and we sell it to the co-op, and but to have, give people that that connection, it both gives us, we have something we're selling, but let them come back up the line and have that direct connection to the source.
Yeah, and the other thing is the the bad apples are the ones who make the news. You know, when there's a manure spill, when there's a cruelty to animals video, that makes the news. Nobody's going to come to your farm, a news reporter, and say, hey, you do a really good job. Can I have a story about you? Put ourselves out there on social media, on, you know, contact people and make yourselves available. Um, get involved in community things. Just put a face to your farm so that when people see something like that, they have someone to go to and say, well, you know, that farmer down the road, I think they do a pretty good job. Maybe I could go there and, and ask them why things like this happen. And, you know, they, they need someone to go to because they're not going to see the good stuff on media unless we put it there. Well, I can so appreciate everything that you guys are saying and can completely relate to pretty much all of it. Um, and it's funny, I was going to ask almost the same question, but I'm going to ask a different one. Um, as you guys are starting out in, you know, whether you're working with, through a family transition or starting your own dairy, um, do you work with an advisory team? Um, what types of people are on that team? And um, how, how does that affect your business? What advice would you give for other people looking to find good advisors that can kind of give the outside eye into their business? Uh, when we form our LLC, um, we kind of work with three different people. Uh, one, a lawyer to kind of, we had to write an agreement, agreement up, um, work with a financial advisor and our accountant. And I think all three of them were very important because as you, you know, transition ownership and stuff, the government will figure out a way to tax you to your grave. And you have to have somebody that has a lot of experience in, in doing what you're looking to do so you can get around as much as that as possible legally. And um, and just uh, a lawyer that is, it has experience that can write a good agreement that everyone is comfortable with and, um, and, that, and just uh, help cutting our account there in, in the meetings too. And, just so, you know, he knew a lot more about the, the tax stuff and yeah, so. I guess for us, uh, we work very closely with the pro program at Cornell. They're involved in the information and everything that works there. Um, some of the other things we've done is just get out and tour, do as much touring as you can, get the networks, you know, get people's phone numbers and just try to find out people that are doing really good job at whatever your goals are, and, and you just can't be afraid to yell and ask them or go see them and say, hey, what are you doing that, you know, maybe I'm not doing quite as well as you are, and usually they're more than willing to, willing to help you again. Yeah, I guess I was pretty similar with Brent as we made um, our transition to the LLC. We worked with our farm accountant and uh, our lawyer, and like, it's very similar as far as the transition part, the most efficient way, um, or I guess the easiest way to try to avoid, you know, for tax purposes. Um, that's how we, we went about it, and it went really well. We try to meet about every year to try to rehash things or see how everything's going, and I think it's great that we all get a chance to sit down, you know, and the five of us or six of us are there, and uh, we can actually go through stuff together. Because I know if we wouldn't sit down with a lawyer, it'd be very difficult for us to actually sit down and go through that stuff together. It kind of gives you an outside eye on things, so um, I guess that's how we approach that. Yeah, on, on advisors, there's an old proverb, claims fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, their success. And, and beyond just the lawyers and the accountants, I think it's important there's even farm transition specialists that sometimes their focus is even on just the communication and the familial relational issues of transition, which are probably as important as the dollars and cents and nuts and bolts of LLCs and operational agreements. And so it's drawing from that enormous pool of advisors that collects every aspect of the farm is having those conversations with your veterinarian teams, having those conversations with the nutritionist. And, and those are people that get on a lot of farms and so you can say, what about this aspect? And right there, you've got some great advice. And so I would say anyone can be an advisor just asking a question. Yeah, 
I have been thinking about uh, two questions that are expressed in on the 20 years ahead, and uh, this gentleman's question, Alan, on uh, the uh, uh, animal uh, people. Uh, what do you think about cold? Do you expect in 20 years from now, will the uh, US housing population be completely fault? Will your bird be fault completely by then, 20 years from now? Yeah. I, I can get it started anyway. Um, I think cold is definitely going to grow just last Friday. Hopefully my first homozygous cold cat was born. We'll see if the parent of the cold. Mom's cold, daddy's cold. There's a chance. Certainly the pen looks like she's cold. And I think there's going to be more and more of a place for that. I, even within my own farm, my breeding philosophy is to create sires that commercial dairymen are going to want to buy by cane after cane after cane of that sire that I've bred and developed because it's a bull that they can just pull and use and it's going to make the next generation of, of trouble-free, thriving, high-protein, high-fat cow that every commercial guy lo loves and wow, if he doesn't have to be born that calf, that's, that's a great added moment. So I don't know if 100% full, but I would say we're going to see well over a quarter full by 20 years from now. Yeah, I guess my opinion, I guess it's like anything else, um, it's going to have its place, but I don't think it's going to be, you know, extremely dominant. I think it's going to continue to grow from where it has been, um, and maybe with the homozygous mold. Um, anytime an operation can cut out uh, a job like the morning, whether it's, you know, the pace or however you do it, um, it's certainly an added benefit. You can put your time in other places, um, but just, I guess in our operation, We'll use it a little bit, but we won't be completely cold or shoot to be completely cold. But you know, maybe in the future, maybe you might have to be cold for the animal welfare and you know the thoughts of dehorning and all that. And so, but I can see it as being uh, growing, but not being 100%. I, I got a question. Uh, it doesn't relate to that, but um, what advice would each of you give to high schoolers or college students? Or contemplating a career as a dairy producer, as a dairy producer. So, if you could give our, our juniors some advice, young people, high school, college age. What what advice would you give? Ashley, let me start. With you. Um, I guess I would say, make sure you wait for the right opportunity. Don't necessarily just jump into the first thing that comes your way just because you think it's great without really thinking. Um, and you have to be willing to take some risk to get the reward. Um, but definitely think really hard about it because this is something that if you're really in this, you're going to dedicate your life to it. And so you need to make sure that you're taking out an opportunity to end up being what you want to do. Yeah, I would say to a young person, explore and learn. Explore the, the world beyond and get out really far and, and explore the world within and, and really ask yourself those questions. What am I good at? What what am I really passionate about? What what makes me get up in the morning and go, yes, another day. This is great. And and so those, those are the things to explore and learn. And then once you know those things, enjoy it and, and thrive in being who you are. Yeah, I kind of agree with uh, what Dan said, um, but for me, 
you know, the biggest thing is still get your education. I mean, we all know education is extremely important. Um, not only you can learn about dairy and everything else, but someday you decide not to do that. You still have that fallback plan where you, you still can get a job within, within agriculture or, or wherever you want with, you know, good education. Um, but to me, you know, as far as advice you should give to them, um, some days are going to be better than others. I mean, we all know that farming has its ups and downs. For me, the positives certainly outweigh the negatives, but there are some tough days where things don't go quite right. We all know that, but you better be prepared for, you know, a few swings, even with, you know, with no prices, and, you know, we're at a fortunate time right now. Um, there are a few swings, but it's certainly a worthwhile career and something I enjoy doing. I guess I would uh, tell somebody that, uh, you know, it's, it's a very bright future for the industry, but the biggest thing is getting out of your comfort zone. I know I've, uh, it's probably a big step for me to come here today, but uh, the more I've pushed myself and I thought, wow, I can never do that, and I just push a little bit harder, um, it's really opened up a lot of doors and a lot of opportunities for me. I, throughout, uh, when I was in college, I probably worked for six or eight different farms, and even if it was just for a two-week or a three-week internship, uh, kind of between break or something, it was, it allowed me to, to travel and get to see different parts of the country and uh, um, just kind of get out and keep pushing myself. And so I guess that's what I would tell um, For me, my advice would be for high schoolers is to go and get an education and, you know, just don't go back and work on the farm. You know, you need to get out there and see things and, you know, find a college or a university that, that fits you. Go and visit a couple. You know, I, I went to Penn State and my dad and uncles that I went to Penn State. And that was the only place I wanted to go. And I don't regret that, but I, I wish I had maybe gone out and, and uh, checked out some other things. But, you know, find a, a college or university that has a group of people that you can relate to because, you know, you have friends in high school, but until you get to college, those are the people that they're going to be your life. Friends are going to be your support network, um, and then when you do get to college, you know, take advantage of every opportunity that, that you have. You know, whether it's a, you know, a class on crop care or, or even beef production, or you know, do the dairy judging team and dairy challenge, and um, just expose yourself to as much as possible, and you know, travel as possible, and, and also take a to internships. I know I, I had the opportunity to internship with the Holtzin Association and you know and it was, I learned a lot from it and there, I apply a lot of what I learned on a daily basis now in what I do but uh, go out and work for another farm for a summer or you know as an intern or go work you know sell seed or go off to you know some foreign place and you know learn you know see farms and just explore and you know take advantage of what you the opportunities you have and to further yourself uh, for the future. All right, I don't have time. I'm going to have one final question, and then I know the panelists will be around here if you want to talk to them a little bit more. But, but I will ask you this. What makes you... Uh, I would say for at least the past five, six thousand years, people have milked cows and enjoyed milk. And I say we got at least another five, six thousand years. <laughs> Let's enjoy it. Whether you're talking about 
um, you know, selling show calves or show cows or genomic heifers or even the milk price has been phenomenal this past year. Beef price is at an all-time high. I mean, even bull calf price, uh, a couple days old, you know, you get two or three hundred dollars farm or steer price. Um, to me, there's so many different ways to make money, and that's why I think you have to be so optimistic whether you milk 50 cows or 500 cows. Um, and not only that, going along with what you said with the uh, technology, the robots, and there's so much more technology and coming out that you have to be optimistic because it's, um, like I said, it's just so many different ways no matter which way you approach it, I think you can be successful. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with that what everybody else said. I mean, they're, they're spot on in that. And I'll say the one thing uh, makes, makes you the most optimistic is probably the past. If you look at how far we've come in the last 10 or 15 or, or 50 years, it gives you a lot of excitement for where we're going to be in the next 10 or, or 15 or 20 years. You know there's always going to be somebody pushing the next level, and, and uh, hopefully it's us. Yeah, I agree with everything the other uh, four panelists said, but I'll add uh, the people involved. Uh, and, uh, it just uh, to come to something like this and meet so many people from different backgrounds, and everyone has a, a common goal, and it's just to, to improve the Holstein breed and, and produce more milk and uh, just improve the dairy industry as a whole. Um, you know, that's something I really took away from Wadi a lot. You know, there's a lot of really uh, great, great young people coming into the industry, and uh, I'm really excited to be a part of that. Well, I'll tell you what makes me the most uh, optimistic about the future of the dairy industry is great young people like this group right here. Let's give it up for them.